This is CBC Vancouver News. Then I start to see everyone run. And that's when my, my heart started to pound. The latest from witnesses and police on the brazen downtown shooting just blocks away from BC Place where thousands of soccer fans were headed. Plus... What we do expect in any situation that we're in is a level of decency and respect and to be treated with respect. What's behind the sudden severed relationship between the Vancouver Police Board and a committee it created? Also... <laughs> Taking home the Stanley Cup this year. Hoping we get at least out of the first round through the second would be really great. Canucks fans have high hopes as their team becomes the first in Canada to clinch a playoff spot this season. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. An update tonight on the late afternoon shooting on Robson Street yesterday. Witnesses say when they first heard gunshots, they couldn't believe such a thing would happen in the heart of downtown Vancouver. My, my heart started to pound because I, I only heard, like, heard one shot first and then it was back to back, two, three more. Police reopened Robson Street this morning after keeping it closed overnight while they collected evidence. The window of the Tim Hortons that was hit in the crossfire is now boarded up. Police confirm two dogs that were in the vehicle that was shot at were injured. They say those involved in the violence are known to police. They believe they're part of the province-wide criminal activity. For now, Vancouver police say they're increasing officer visibility in downtown and around Vancouver. Taking you to Victoria now, and one person is dead, another hospitalized following a stabbing downtown. Around 4 a.m., police were called to Pandora Avenue and around Blanchard Street. My buddy said there was two guys arguing behind the bus stop. So he went to his kitchen and came back and looked out again, and he only seen one guy laying down in the back of the bus stop. The scene was taped off for much of the day under a heavy police presence. Officers also appear to be investigating inside the Ocean Island Inn nearby. One person has been taken into custody in that case, and investigators say there is no further risk to the public. A committee created to improve relations between police and Vancouver's black community has abruptly cut ties with the police board. The African Descent Advisory Committee was formed just over two years ago. But as Janella Hamilton reports, the group says they have felt disrespected and dismissed. To me, it was a lost opportunity. Sadie Keen was co-chair of the Vancouver Police Department's African Descent Advisory Committee, a group that was formed in late 2021, made up of community leaders with lived experience. There are scholars there, doctors, lawyers, community activists. But over its two-year term with the VPD, the group says it has felt disrespected and undervalued. We didn't and don't expect everything that we say and think our uh, recommendations to be taken up and or taken forward. What we do expect in any situation that we're in is a level of decency and respect and to be treated with respect. Ultimately, it reached a point where the committee felt it's necessary to cut ties with the Vancouver Police Board, which oversees the VPD. In a recent letter to the board, they say we can no longer wait for you and senior management of the force to get the fact that we can only have a safe community if we are committed to working together. This police reform advocate says not having the committee could be detrimental for the black community. That leaves the folks who are actually being targeted, the people who need to have their voices heard, left with no one to represent them. It is insulting to have people engage and involved when you have already made a judgment call. The return of the VPD's school officer liaison program was also a critical moment for the committee. They were never given the chance to vote on the policy, despite allegedly being told they would be. Even if we were generous, we would say that the board were just rude and uh, their behavior is totally unacceptable. CBC News reached out to the Vancouver Police Board. The executive director redirected us to the VPD for comment. We value the relationship that we have 
um, that we have had with the African Descent Advisory Committee. We'll be reaching out to them, um, speaking with them directly uh, about the reasons behind their decision. I really hope though that the police will take this opportunity to learn and to look at these incredible people who have decided to walk away from them and, you know, reflect on that. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. An environmental group is expressing disappointment with the province's decision to approve a new LNG export facility. The Fortis BC Tilbury jet will be used, jetty will be used to fill ships exporting liquefied natural gas right around the world. If Tilbury LNG were to be built, uh, it would be built right in the middle of the most important river for salmon on earth, uh, the Fraser River. If you eat a salmon in British Columbia, there's a good chance it's going to pass right by Tilbury LNG at some point uh, in its lifetime. The cities of Richmond, Vancouver, Port Moody, Burnaby and New Westminster have all voted to oppose the project. The BC government has granted an environmental assessment certificate with 22 conditions, but ultimately the jetty must still receive federal approval. A BC conservation group wants the feds to keep boaters further away from endangered southern resident killer whales. Washington State recently passed a bill that will require a 1,000-yard periphery around the animals. The Raincourse Cons Conservation Foundation is urging Ottawa to extend the new regulation into Canadian waters as well. We're talking about a transboundary species, so agreeing on the prote protection measures is fundamental, but there's also consistency with uh, best available science. According to the organization, the primary threat to southern resident killer whales is a lack of prey. Underwater noise created from vessels exacerbates that threat, they say, and keeping boats further away is meant to give the whales a better chance of catching food. Last year, Ottawa introduced several new measures to protect the whales, including a 400-meter buffer that boaters must abide by. However, that is only in effect until the end of May. A restaurant owner in Nanaimo is using her business to give back to her community. The newly opened Sandy's Ukrainian Kitchen has hired six Ukrainian newcomers so far. She says she feels compelled to help as the war has taken many, the lives of many of her family members. Lost 78 family members that I know of because we haven't heard and the area where they farmed was bombed and uh, everything was covered in. She has led a fundraising effort that's generated over $100,000 so far help to help Ukrainians fleeing their homeland. Roughly 2,000 Ukrainians have landed in the Nanaimo region over the past two years. Well, still on the island, a seasonal bus service connecting Victoria with Tofino has returned and just in time for prime tourist season. After a few years of off and on service, the Wilson Group relaunched its route again this Easter weekend. Our Claire Palmer caught up with the bus on its Nanaimo stop, halfway through the trip on its first weekend back. Tourists and locals alike are happy to see the bus return this week. I wouldn't have been able to get to Tofino otherwise. Um, yeah, that was the only option. I mean, other than a taxi or something, and that's going to cost so much money. So this is affordable, and I was able to book there and back. A stop at Nanaimo's Departure Bay Ferry Terminal makes it so you can walk off the ferry and onto the bus, with many other stops along the way. We've heard from so many people how important it is to be able to move people either for business pleasure or just like for a doctor's appointment, for any kind of uh, intercity travel. We're so glad to be back on the road. The bus used to run year-round until late 2022 when they announced a shift to seasonal service. They had been operating at a loss in the low season. The bus did run last summer but was impacted by the highway foreclosures. The company's owner says he's hoping to return to full-time service one day and that they will run the bus as long as possible this year into fall and hopefully into winter. The numbers are always stronger in spring and summer, so it allows us to do the service now. Um, uh, and we continue to uh, talk to governments at all levels around uh, subsidization to allow us to run it year round and, uh, and seven days a week. And we will not stop that, uh, those conversations. The bus also serves as valuable inner city transportation for island locals who often find themselves stuck without other options. And I, I feel for the rural communities that are disconnected right now, and I think it, the solution is, is not that hard, really. There, there's a lot of money that gets flowed to public uh, urban transit right across this country. And it would just be a fraction of that 
needed to reconnect the country in the intercity busing and for our rural communities. Intercity transportation has long been needed on the island. Wilson is the only coach service with bathroom, luggage storage and a seat belt amongst other amenities. Island Link also operates an inner city bus route with a smaller vehicle. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. Well, the Vancouver Canucks have become the first Canadian team to clinch a playoff spot this season. Vancouver will host playoff games at Rogers Arena for the first time in nine years. We caught up with fans ahead of the Canucks' quest to snag their first Stanley Cup victory in the team's 53-year history. <laughs> Pretty excited. It's been a while. Oh, we're ready for it. It feels weird. It feels weird. It feels weird, but we're excited. Fantastic. Go Canucks, go. Go Canucks, go. <laughs> Yay! Go Canucks, go. Uh, where do you think we're going to go this year? All the way. Uh, All the way, baby. All the way. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. And then uh, we got tickets for the playoffs, too. So we can hold the Stanley Cup this year. I don't want to jinx anything, so. I was going, hoping we'd get at least out of the first round through the second would be really great. <laughs> oh, this is finally going to happen. It's happened you, you've been waiting a long time. 43 years. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> well, hundreds of families spent Easter Sunday at the annual Bunny Fest in Richmond. As Saurabh Sandhu explains, the event is meant to get more people considering rabbit adoption. <laughs> 12-year-old Icy is enjoying meeting new people. They come bearing his favorite food, kale. <laughs> Visitors can also get their Easter bunny fix by feeding treats to their new furry friends. We have organic and all-natural small animal treats for rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs, chinchillas, and even pet rats. For a donation, you can even take a picture with your favorite bunny rabbit. Some bunnies are a bit more docile and they tend to just kind of want to hang out. Some bunnies get to be more active, especially if they're younger, then they probably won't be good for kind of staying still for photo shoots. The event is put together by Rabbitat's Rescue Society in an attempt to encourage adoption of rescued rabbits and to raise awareness about challenges with keeping rabbits as pets. We get to identify people who may want to adopt rabbits and we can also find out who maybe shouldn't adopt rabbits, and then we will suggest that they adopt a stuffy instead. This bunny rabbit is named Tai Mai. He was discovered abandoned last Easter in Richmond. He was still drinking milk. Uh, he definitely wouldn't have survived out there. Due to their frequent breeding cycles, Sadman says keeping a check on rabbit population is a big challenge. She says her society is already pushed to the limit and unable to take any more animals. Well, we have about 500 rabbits under our roof at our sanctuaries right now. The Rabbitats Rescue Society says it's developing new destinations for unwanted rabbits, along with programs to control the feral populations. But in the meantime, they're urging those looking for a rabbit as a pet this Easter to consider adopting a rescued one. So Rob Sandhu, CBC News, Richmond. Well, Vancouver's first-of-its-kind free pet pantry has opened in the West End. Community members are encouraged to donate and take food as needed. Those behind it say they've been scrambling to keep up with demand. So this is the first of its kind. A lot of people have been hating hard times lately, so it's for anybody. Where I used to live, there's a human version of this. Mm -hmm. So it's like the community pantry. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of starting a dog food bank. It's basically take what you need, leave what you can. So you can come and donate food. You can come pick up food if you need it. Well, I think West End is a great community. We've been here for about 10, 11 years. So over the years, I've noticed that there are lots and lots of uh, pet owners uh, from all walks of life. So we've definitely noticed that there might be a need. So when Brittany brought out the idea to us, we, we thought it was just the best idea ever. I stock the pantry from local pet stores, local vet offices. I pick up food and um, drop it off a couple times a week. I've been hitting a wall with, with donations. There's been less and less, and there's been such a high demand for donations. We are going to be asking for Home Depot gift cards to build a second a pantry. We accept gear, so leashes, harnesses, uh, jackets, collars, uh, wet food, dry food, open food. 
I started it, I'm just a regular person, anybody can. You just reach out to a local builder or local companies to ask them to help build one. Or you can build one uh, if, in your garage if you have one or if you have the skill to do so. I hope to have one in every neighborhood. I want to take over the city. <laughs>Up next, the Pope is decrying civilian deaths in Gaza. Joining the call for an immediate ceasefire. We'll have more on that after the break. Welcome back. The federal government's next carbon price hike is about to kick in. Starting tomorrow, the costs of gasoline and natural gas will go up in provinces that don't have their own carbon pricing plans, which is most of them. B.C. is exempt from Ottawa's carbon tax because it already has its own. As the CBC's Marina von Stackelberg explains, Manitoba may soon follow suit. Filling up at the gas pump will soon cost many Canadians an extra three cents per litre. Home heating will be more pricey too. This year's federal carbon tax hike comes after months of pressure on the Liberal government, especially from premiers who say cash-strapped Canadians can't afford it. Now Manitoba's premier is making the case for an exemption. Manitoba has a really strong case to make that we're going to hit net zero without a consumer-facing uh, carbon tax. BC and Quebec are already exempt because they brought in their own carbon pricing programs that meet or exceed the federal carbon tax. 
Manitoba plans to present Ottawa with its own plan, which Wab Canoe says can meet the bar, in part because of hydropower. We have effectively decarbonized our electricity in Manitoba, and that's true today. Canada's Deputy Prime Minister says Ottawa is all ears. Where provinces and territories are interested in and are prepared to come forward with their own provincial or territorial plans to put a price on pollution, um, we are very, very keen to work with them. Who's ready to axe the tax? It comes as federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev rallied against the tax this week in Winnipeg and met with Premier Canu. As for uh, his, the Premier's view on the April Fool's Day Trudeau tax hike, uh, he, he can speak for himself. He's uh, more than capable and I'm happy to work with him and anyone. Uh, to uh, bring home lower prices for Canadians. But more than 300 economists signed a letter this week supporting the carbon tax, arguing that it does not contribute to inflation, despite what opponents say. Any alternative that they're likely to suggest is going to be more expensive or more damaging for the economy than the carbon price. Ottawa offsets the carbon tax by sending Canadians rebate checks. Those will also increase April 1st. The federal government says 80% of households get more money back than they pay out. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, taking you overseas, Gaza truce talks resumed today in Cairo. Israel sent a delegation. Hamas reportedly did not, instead waiting for any new Israeli offers. In Gaza, meanwhile, Israel says it killed a militant leader in a strike on a hospital courtyard. <laughs> Israel says a militant command center was located there. Footage shows damage among tents. Four deaths were reported. Elsewhere, Israeli forces remain inside Gaza City's Al Shifa Hospital. Two hospitals in southern Gaza are still blockaded. Across the enclave, 77 people were reported killed since yesterday. The Pope today called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza while delivering his Easter Sunday message in St. Peter's Square. Francis railed, Francis railed at the suffering of children in Gaza. He appealed for humanitarian aid to be ensured and for all Israeli hostages to be released. A crowd of 60,000 attended the weekend's events. Well, for many Christians, this holiday weekend is a time for family. But for many seniors living alone, Easter can add longing to their isolation. The CBC's Kwabina Oduro looks at how one group in Quebec is trying to change that. I can certainly eat the sugar pie. For Easter weekend this year, Diane Lewis is sharing a meal with some new faces. Her children are spread out all over the globe, from Tennessee to Sweden, making Easter weekend emotional. Lonely. Sad. But you know, they say... If your kids move away from you, it's because you brought them up right, because they don't need you. But it's hard. The 82-year-old says those feelings reached new heights during the pandemic, so she decided to take action. Reaching out to Little Brothers, a group that provides support to seniors aged 75 and older across Quebec. I love it. It's warm. It's supportive. It feels very reassuring that you're not alone, you know, that there's somebody there. According to Statistics Canada, about one in five Canadian seniors aged 65 and older reported experiencing loneliness in 2019 and 2020. Last November, the World Health Organization declared loneliness a global public health concern. I think a lot of older people are connected to social media and to, I think people are are many people, older people, are a little bit poorer than they were too, and things are a little bit more expensive, so there's less money to spend on things. If you smile. This volunteer says with more people feeling lonely, holiday brunches are more important than ever. It reminds them that um, that they still matter to someone, that they're not forgotten, that uh, you know people want to want their company, want them to share in in a festive meal. For 83-year-old Janet Broxup, it's more than a meal. Her children also live in different countries. It looks like a small group, but it's really a community, a family. It's very nice. I love it. <laughs> Little Brothers is hoping to expand its services across Canada, so more seniors will be able to be part of the family. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal.
You're looking at a live shot of the Port of Vancouver. A sunny and warm Easter weekend will slowly give way to a chance of showers. So your five-day forecast is next. And time for a look at the five-day forecast, really shaping up to be a nice long weekend right across the province. Looking at the overnight lows and conditions, you can see cloud cover for most of BC and Cranbrook. It's only a 30% chance of those flurries, but otherwise we've got this high pressure system that's in place from north to south. That's going to continue into early next week. And then you can see Tuesday, it starts to break down through the north central coast as that next system moves south. That's when we'll likely see a return of the rain, at least in coastal sections. But until then, enjoy those blue skies. We did have some high cloud cover, at least in Vancouver and around the south coast for most of today. And we might see that again tomorrow, but largely in the northern parts of the province. And we do have a strong wind warning in effect for uh, northern BC, right near the northern border. So that'll likely be tomorrow night. 80 kil kilometer an hour winds is being what's uh, forecast from Environment Canada. Otherwise, here's the five-day forecast for Metro Vancouver. As we said, lots of sunshine, even reaching those mid-teens come uh, Easter Monday. So enjoy those conditions while they last through the long weekend, because those uh, clouds and the unstable air mass with some of that rain will re likely return midweek. That is your late news for this Sunday, March 31st. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online at cbc.ca/bc. Thanks for watching this long weekend. Happy Easter.